and Welcome to the Halftime Report, presented by Tackle Trading. Welcome to the Halftime Report, presented by... That's always my favorite part of that one, Matt. Uh, how are you doing this morning? Coach T, Coach Matt, Coach, Coach Christian, and producer Cam here with you. Matt, how are you doing today? You know, Tim, doing absolutely great here today. I'm actually down visiting uh, our our family down in oh, good old fashioned in Emory County, Utah, and uh, luckily they still have internet down here, so I was able to uh, to get on. But uh, we're down in God's country today. Well, and just as a way to kind of broaden our coaching staff here and have a more dynamic halftime report, and just in case your Wi-Fi dropped, we asked Coach Christian to come on in here from across the pond. Bergamo, Italy, and looking particularly glowing here tonight there, Christian. How are you, sir? I'm fine, sir. Been working today, writing some good stuff for you guys. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I love the writing. By the way, one of the best writers we have over at Tackle Trading. If you're a regular member in our community and you read those daily emails, Christian write, writes a lot of those daily emails, and he's very, very good at it. Let's dive right into the analysis here in the market today, Matt. Now, Got a couple of things obviously happening. We spent a lot of time in our halftime report yesterday talking about Google. They're in the news today. Uh, we also spent quite a bit of time talking about Biogen and prepped a few earnings trades and earnings are again in the news today. But the market, I'd say the news of the day is just a breakout and whether or not you believe it or not. I mean, the headlines, there's nothing really crazy out there. Let's start with the ES contract here in Thinkorswim. And let me, maybe. Let's get your take on this. Let's start with Christian. Christian, is this a breakout or a fake out? And uh, how do you read this chart? Well, that's a difficult question because if you look not in the futures, but in the, uh, the S&P 500 ETF or the S&P index, uh, you can see there is, a, there is a breakout. It looks like a breakout, but the volume is concerning. At least for me, my reading. And I don't know. Uh, although it's a breakout, no doubt, no question about it, but the volume is really, really low. You know, Matt, you have a common gap here, you know, from the Google earnings, uh, a stock that size $800 billion can gap the entire market on the ETF SPY. You know, there's many ways to measure the S and P 500. We gap from about the close of yesterday, the, la the last close price 280.2. And we opened up today up here at 281.79 that puts you squarely above the resistance point. Is this a strengthening market, Matt? Is this just a confirming bullish trend that we've already seen? What's your read on this one? Well, I think the most likely scenario here was gonna be the breakout of the S&P. I, I, I would argue the S&P broke out last week when it, got, uh, when it closed above 2,800. Um, but at the same time, I agree with Christian, Tim, if you'll add the volume indicator, on, on your thinkorswim chart here, what you're going to see is you're going to see a <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to see a slight lack of conviction when it comes to buying this breakout, and volume for a lot of people is kind of a mis misunderstood indicator. There's never more buying volume than there is selling volume, and there's never more selling volume than there is buying volume. It's a key indication of participation, is what it really is. And when you when you're looking for a potential breakout scenario here you want to see an increase in participation. That's a very important indicator when it comes to, you know, the, the difference between a breakout versus a fake out. And right now, because you have volume and, and again, it's still, you know, fairly early in the day, but when I'm looking at really kind of the last week as the market is trying to get above 280 on the, e on the S and P and above, you know, 2,800 on the, on the ES contract, I'm seeing a lack of enthusiasm regarding these these potential breakouts that doesn't mean the market can't continue to fade and fade and fade and fade you got to buy what you see and what you see is a potential breakout on the s p no doubt about that but i'm seeing a substantial decrease in volume on this potential breakout and that is a slight concern once again it is a measurement of enthusiasm to a certain extent mm -hmm. and i just don't think there's a lot of people that are very enthusiastic which is amazing to me because Tim, this is this is absolutely an amazing earnings season. It's an amazing earnings season where you basically have, 
you know, close to 90% of, of S&P 500 companies, Dow Jones companies, NASDAQ companies, and we still have a lot of companies, you know, to report earnings, but you still have about 90% of all companies reporting better than, uh, better than expected earnings per shares, better than expected revenues. Forward guidance has been pretty decent so far, and yet you're still seeing a marketplace that is not rip-roaring. You're seeing a market that, in, in my estimation, is still slightly concerned over the overall trade tariffs. I mean, take Harley-Davidson, for example, reported great earnings, beat earnings per share, beat revenues. But in their, in their guidance, they showed concern about 45 to $55 million that could be impacted based on tariffs. And I still think that tariff discussion, even though Wall Street – is is even though Wall Street is is listening less and less and less to what comes out of the uh, out of the White House, they're still showing a, a, a little bit of a concern, and that's just simply because you know we're seeing that with less volume. But you know, based on what I'm seeing in these earnings reports, we should be rip roaring up, and you're seeing a little bit of co- hesitation. Well, and, and let's kind of analyze that a little bit. I think that that's a, a good point. And Hog, I, beautiful chart, in my opinion. We'll go back to the daily chart on that. But before we move past the SPY, Matt, there's just a, a split in opinion. That's what a market is, right? You know, the market always has buyers and sellers, people who believe in the storylines and people who don't. If you're a bull right now, and I am a bull, and you're a bull, but we're concerned, you, you're just trading what the data is. The data is very clear. Companies are beating earnings. They've been taking advantage of the tax cuts and the economy still is fairly strong. Unemployment's very low. You know, uh, consumer sentiment is at an all time high. Economic indicators have been strong and the market is showing strength. Now, if you don't follow up on that by putting all of your money into the stock market at an all time high, that's why you have low participation. The volume is at an extreme low. This is a 10-year weekly chart on the S&P 500, and you'll notice the volume in the last few months, Matt, has been tapering off. So as the market has found itself, and this is the current year, you know, volatility in February, volatility in April, all of this rally back has not even come close to what the participation rate was back when the sell-offs were happening. Now, that's pretty common. You know, volume usually picks up during a sell-off. No, fears, uh, fears uh, a stronger emotion than greed, no doubt about that. But it, I mean, when you're when you're talking about being at the top of nine year highs, when you're talking about a market cycle that, you know, the only other market that has ever extended this bullish market was the dot com market. If you kind of equate that to the 87 to 2000 uh, market, that was the longest market in the history of the modern markets. You're talking about the second most overvalued market from a P.E. ratio. You're talking about the second longest bull market that we've ever had without some form of deep correction or recession. Um, you're talking about prices at all time highs. You're talking about wage stagnation, prices at all time highs. This market has been driven by debt. It's been driven by quantitative easing. It's been driven by low interest rates. It's been driven by credit. It's been driven by debt. It's been driven by consumers using debt to buy cars and trucks and boats and things they don't need. And that is starting to dry up. They, you know, When you talk about the percentage of the consumer's debt versus income right now, you're talking over, over 50% right now. So you're talking about a market at all-time highs. You're talking about P ratios as second, as second highest it's ever been. And you're talking about consumers not having the ability to continue to fund their, their lifestyle the same way they have in the past. Yeah, you're going to have participation issues at the top. You're going to have liquidity problems at the top. And that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. I mean, you had a 92-month run at that point right there between 1991 and 2001 from uh, – you know, trough to peak. Uh, then you had the big crash in 2000, obviously. You have the cycle there in 2007 and 8. Then we had a recession. Matt, we're going on nine years here, and that's where the concern is. But again, it always comes back to that debate in trading. Right now, the action in the market is strong, right? So what do you do with it? You trade what you see. You do the best you can to apply trading strategies that fit your overall portfolio design and system in the current conditions we're in. Google well, carrying okay, the market t- today. Hold on. Let, let, let's talk about that, though, though, because the economy is doing good. Can we all agree with that? That the economy is doing decent? P- Peter Schiff doesn't, but I do. I do believe the economy is doing good, yeah. Listen, I, it might be built on a house of cards and it might be built on debt, but you can't make the, you can't make the argument that unemployment is not at 3.9% or 4%. Yeah, but the and labor participation rate is not the same as the unemployment rate. And we yeah, do have a lot of people not working. Rate. 
Yeah, but that labor t- participation rate can be impacted outside of other things known as economics. It can be impacted just because baby boomers are coming out of the market. It, be- it can become, you know, uh, dormant to a certain extent just because of certain demographics who are not working any longer. 62.7% of the population is currently working. And yes, that is, you know, some somewhere towards a five decade low, no doubt about that. But we've seen initial claims go down every single week, pretty much this entire year. Your unemployment rate is at 3.94%. Uh, industrial production on the on the industrial ports have been above recessionary levels for years and years and years now. Consumer confidence is at a, a, a high. Retail sales are still strong. Housing data has recovered. You're talking about an economy from, from a pure economic perspective. You're talking about an economy that's doing okay outside of you know GDP growth, which has never beat inflation for nine straight years. And that's normal in my estimation when you're not built on true economic value, but you're built on you know a debt or a credit type economy. My whole point is if the economy based on its economic reports in earnings season, 90% of companies are outperforming earnings, why isn't this market literally rip roaring based on the data we're seeing coming out of earnings season. And to me, it's because of a liquidity concern. It's because people can't afford to go out there and buy as many stocks. People are a little concerned. People are, you know, going through the mundane lifestyle of the summer months. We're sitting here on, you know, Utah, Utah's birthday is today, Tim, right? Okay. So Utah's birthday is today, July 24th. We're sitting here in the drolls of summer. There's going to be a little bit of concern. And that's even though this breakout you know, has 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 been confirmed. It's above that 280 level. I'm still just slightly concerned at that. We're seeing some weakness in the Russell 2000. You're seeing you're seeing a, 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 and with the industrial sector, I'm getting a little concerned about that. We'll look at that in a second. But I think if if there was other concerns out there, such as trade wars, I think this market would be rip roaring right now, 2017 style. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, as we get more companies come through, you've already had Microsoft, you had the banks. Now we've gone through Google. We've got a big, big set of companies even this week that still have to report earnings. Once you get through that data and you start focusing on the, that actual data, I think the market's got some potential upside here. Now, the question is how much? We'll keep talking about it day over day over day. What I'd like to do, Matt, uh, you know, because, you know, obviously you got to think about big picture all the time when you're trading, but you also have to go through the key charts and see if there's anything going on in the market itself. I did see some differences in some of the indexes today. And I want to get Christian and your take on this and tell me what you think is happening. Now, when you look at a heat map, mostly green, you know, the market is strong, uh, technology is strong, materials are strong, healthcare is strong, financials are strong, utilities not so strong today, you know, they do have a little bit of a correction, and some of the service companies are down here today. Uh, as you come down here and look at the different indexes, S&P 500, incredibly strong. Dow Jones Industrial, even stronger. That's actually a better candle today. So relative strength in the industrial sector and also in the large caps. Technology had the gap out map, but you've got a high tail on that candle, which as a technician, you have to have some concern about that tail. But here's where you get the difference, you know, and they're not correlated right now. The Russell's actually down. What does it tell you, Christian, when small cap companies are down on a day where the rest of the market is up? So they're not following the bullish sentiment, I guess. So even though the, the people are uh, optimistic, a little bit optimistic with the market, with, the, uh, with some, some good earnings coming out, I mean, the Russell 2000 are not big companies. They are mid-cap companies, you know, so small-cap companies. And I think people are not that optimistic with the, with the scenario, I guess. So, or people are just jumping off of the uh, the Russell 2000 to go to the major indexes, it's like the money is flowing to the other to other sectors and other companies. Matt, that's an ugly candle, triple top, even a lower pivot high. If you take it by definition, you hit a high water mark here at 1720. Another high water mark on this pivot at 1715. We hit a high here today at 1710. Hasn't confirmed until it closes this candlestick. Do you have concern about that wedge developing on the top of the Russell? Um, no, not not necessarily yet. I mean, ugly candle yet uh, right now today, no doubt about that. 
um, you know, from the from the Russell 2000 from in May and June, I mean, just absolutely just freight train. It was doing absolutely amazing. Uh, you were seeing money flow into technology. You were seeing money flow in the Russell 2000. Money was coming out of industrials and it was coming out of your blue chip S&P 500 companies. And I think the only thing you're really kind of seeing is money come back into the blue chips. You know, I, I don't think this is anything to be too gravely concerned about the, the small mid cap stocks, the Russell 2000, the $2 billion to $10 billion companies. I, I don't think you should be too concerned about that. I'm still seeing a, a cup and handle formation kind of forming on the Russell 2000. It's taking a little bit of stagnation right now, but I just see a little bit of money going into your blue chips versus your Russell 2000 stocks. Maybe a little profit taking over the last week, week and a half. Yeah, I mean, money's coming out of those small caps as it's rotating, there's no doubt about it. That cup and handle is still in play, but not if it broke this little, you know, ridge of the, of the handle right here. 1680, 1675, somewhere in there is where we'd want to look at it. Volatility, same thing we see every pretty much every day. You know, down here in the dumps the last few weeks, nothing really going on. Emerging markets, Matt, are showing more strength from a percentage perspective than anything else today. The EEM, which is mostly the, you know, the BRICS type countries, Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, those types, you are seeing an upward movement, but general weakness over the course of the year. More to come back there, I'm sure, as some of this rotation continues and the broad global markets doing the same kind of thing. One of the biggest well, stories of the day is in commodities, but let me get your thought on that. Is there something going on internationally that you're watching? No, I, I, if you guys want to pick up international companies more than American companies right now, I think that's a mistake. The strength is in the S&P 500 worldwide. The strength is in the, in the NASDAQ right now. Well, and it has been for most of the year, you know, because so much of what's, what we're seeing is rising interest rates in the U.S. Everything that Trump is doing right now, he seems to be getting the benefit of the doubt on that, of what it's going to do for U.S. You know, economics and whatnot. And so the S&P has showed the strength. Wars. It has, but these trade wars will hurt other economies more than it will hurt the U.S. I agree with that. Uh, commodity markets, and as actually, Christian, let me pull you in on that because you live internationally, you think internationally, and I know how often you watch the Brazilian economy. What do you think is going to happen with all this trade war stuff with these emerging markets? Well, one thing that is happening uh, specifically to, 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 to Brazil is that we have election year. Uh, this year is a presidential election, so lots of instability, but people are buying again Brazil as I see the major index in Brazil is going up. Um, the thing is that Trump um, implemented some tariffs on, on, on major commodities, but he gave some relief to Brazilian commodities. Mm -hmm. So Brazilian, from the commodity perspective, is not suffering a lot. And, but the thing is that this move in Brazil this year is that we have election year. And we had, a, it, it, the Brazilian index was completely slaughtered. It had a great January, but an awful year. And then it's coming back again, it hit the bottom. And it's not coming back again because people are, are beginning to buy. But in Brazil, it's happening the same in the United States, I guess. People are buying, are buying the, uh, the blue chip stocks. They're running away from the small cap, the mid cap stocks, and they're running into the blue chip stocks. There is a, even a Brazilian kit. It's called the Brazilian kit. Uh, it's, uh, it's the major banks and the major and state owned companies and people are buying into it. And this is what happened. So yeah, I watch the Brazilian markets every day because I have positions in there. Sure. And, well, and you know what's interesting about just investing in general, Matt, pretty much everything we ever talk about, there's a vehicle that you can use to invest in. You know, there's an ETF on the bond market. There's an ETF on the dollar. There's an ETF on oil. If you get bullish on an idea, the ETF market is one of the best ways to play that. And, you know, I don't play the Brazilian ETF. It's not part of my personal watch list, but there is one, you know, and, and if you ever want to do the analysis on it, it's right there. It's got a chart. It's got fundamentals. It's got companies. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many of them out there. So much of what is happening in my perspective internationally is going to play itself out in the dollar one way or the other first. And this is where we always start the conversation when it comes down to commodities and whatnot. 
Matt, the dollar's pivoting today, which is going to drive uh, oil and gold. And we're going to look at both of those. Do you believe in the dollar strength on this pivot and trigger? Because if you look at candle no. to candle, you just don't. I, I, I'm not. I'm not a buyer or seller here, and I think anybody who makes one case or the other is not reading that chart. Yeah. You've got a very cautious wedge developing pattern. It is rolling into a neutral situation from strong momentum into neutral usually means indecision. Is that right? Yeah, you got about three or four different arguments for different patterns the dollar is creating right now. You can put two technicians in the room and one would make the bull case and they'd be right. And the other one would make the bear case and they'd be right. When the simple reality is what we're seeing is neutrality. That, that's what you're seeing. It was very, very bullish, no doubt about that. Um, I gave it a head and shoulders uh, call about two weeks ago. Uh, that's a neutral condition. You made the argument it was a cup and handle. That's a neutral condition. Um, I, I, I don't think either one of us are right. And I don't think either one of us are wrong until we see some degree of you know, strong movement outside of 95 and a half or you know, underneath 94. Currently at 94.65, it's right there kind of in the middle of support and resistance in my estimation. And, and because of that, I think it's, I think we're neutral until we start to see a breakout one way or the other. Very awesome. similar to what, what the analysis was on gold for months. That's right. You know, that's right. And if you think about it, you know, so much of technical analysis is interpretation. There's not a right way to, to analyze chart each and every time, Matt. And you're right. You get two experts in a room and they would disagree on that. One thing you don't have to disagree on, though, is it is stuck in the middle of that range, you know. You can believe in whatever direction you think it's going to carry from here, but you got 94 on support, 95 and a half on the top, and we're at 94 and a half, you know, 94.64 here. So until I get confirmation one way or the other, you can't really call it too much. Uh, I agree with that. I mean, from, a, from an economic perspective, a fundamental perspective, I do believe in bullish case on the dollar right now. But from a technical perspective, it, it is flat out neutral right now. Crude oil is one of the stronger, you know, commodities for today. Uh, big, beautiful green candles got to be benefiting that swing trade you got on that, Matt. Uh, is this something that you, if somebody's out there watching, is this a trigger entry point to buy? I, I, I triggered in, what was it, three days ago? Right, the 19th, 20th three. in here, yeah. Yeah, it was right there. I triggered in there. Actually, I think it was that candle right there, the the first upward moving on that one. Um, today, yeah, I mean, today you're basically getting a very similar trade signal that I got last week. Um, I could certainly understand this being a pivot. I mean, you're talking about a 1% increase or a 1.5% increase in crude oil today. It's still showing strength, whereas the rest of the broad market has shown weakness intraday. The S&P is now underneath its gap range. The NASDAQ is selling off inter interday. The Russell is at the bottom end of its uh, candle today, showing weakness. So the Russell shows weakness throughout the day. The rest of the blue chip stocks out there showing weakness interday. Crude has shown strength throughout the day today. And, uh, you know, obviously we have the EIA numbers coming out tomorrow. Uh, that's going to throw a monkey wrench in everything, as every economic indicator does. But if you trade crude, you know that already. You've seen this happen over and over and over again. I like the price action today. I like the pivot off of 67. I think this, I think this puppy goes back up into his previous highs at $74, $75. All right, I will push back on that a little bit. I have concern about this level. See, you triggered in down here $2, though, dollar and a half, right? So you're, you're working off of profits. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, if you miss this, you've got to wait until tomorrow after the EIA number, you know? Well, if, you never want to buy the top end of a candle. I'm not making that argument. I mean, we see it fade all the time. Um, I can certainly see that as a trigger point as well. If you're looking at an intraday, if you're looking at an intraday chart, you're you're certainly concerned about that. But Tim, if you're looking at a 15-minute chart, 30-minute chart, 60-minute chart, can't you find some area of concern on every chart that you ever look at in the history of mankind? Well, you can find concern on any time frame, daily, weekly, it doesn't matter. There is no such thing as a perfect chart because it's up to the interpreter. Uh, I will say this, though, when I'm planning my entry points, a lot of it does come down to the daily market cycle. It doesn't matter if you're in Bergamo, Italy, and it's at seven o'clock at night or you're in Salt Lake City and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Guess what? The markets are moving on their cycle. Right. You know, and the crude oil market right now has had most of the action for the morning and the volatility of it, what it normally gets is already done for the day. 
You'll get a push at the end of the day when the commodity markets close at one o'clock, okay? And my time, you know, which is three o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and that's just a live open outcry pit markets. You'll get a little bit of volatility right then. Stock market closes at two, futures market 415. Then you move into Globex markets, Matt, and then we're waiting for other international things. I don't want to buy yeah, into that. Yeah, but we that. do that every single day, literally yeah. every single day. And I'm not going to freak out on a trade that I'm planning on being in for up to a month because there's an intraday resistance level at $69 on the one hour chart. Yeah, but again, you're in the trade. If you're out there and you're not in the trade, because I'm not, right? I'm not, I'm not long crude right now. If you're not in the trade, look at Wednesday here. EIA number, we had a $3 drop, right? The volatility of Wednesday morning is pretty radical when it comes to crude oil. So just one of those prudence things. I don't think you're going to buy at the back end I of a candle. That. What I'm suggesting is if it does break out of 69, okay, mm -hmm. then you have intraday resistance at 70. And if it breaks out of 70, you have intraday resistance at 71. And if it breaks out of 71, you have a very strong intraday resistance level at 73. And if it breaks out of 73, you have a very strong intraday and daily resistance at 75. At what point do you just say, I have enough data and pull the trigger? Because after you the, have those intraday resistance levels on everything. Uh, after the inventory data, I, I think you can make a different argument. Uh, for me, it's just Tuesday afternoon going into that report in the morning when there's not a lot of le left in the trading day. You know, Cr Christian, what's your take on this? When do you trigger? On every no, so hold on. We're going we're gonna to finish this. Thought. Yeah, we can. Hold on. That EIA number comes out every single Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So it's so. Are you going to wait? Are you not going to make a trade on crude on Monday or Tuesday because the weekly report on EIA comes out on Wednesday? It depends. I don't think you do a directional swing trade. So if you're thinking about families of trades, I don't think you do a delta trade. You know, if you've got cushion and it's a part of your system and you also got a 30 to 60 day position trade, uh, that's a different case, and different argument. You know, yeah. if you've got a if you've got a button hook at four days on a swing trade, I mean, that's a completely different animal. No, nah, I, I disagree with that. I got a stop loss. Stop loss will play its job. That EIA, EIA number isn't a Fed report. Right. It's an important report. Stop. I'm not going to stop a trade that looks like a very good pivot simply because I got a report tomorrow. The market knows the report comes out tomorrow. They're buying into today. Hmm. Interesting. Christian, what do you do with economic data in the face of a signal? How do you, how do you handle it in your system? Well, I got to factor in uh, Trump tweets inside economic <laughs> data. That's 50 shades of Twitter because uh he's trying to pick a fight with the iran president now and then i have to factor in in my analysis every day i have to i have to follow trump on twitter no usually uh well, look that's, at just, that's just entertainment there christian that's just entertainment yeah <laughs> just that's all fun. that is just for fun it, it's a yeah. reality tv show on twitter that's all it is yeah, I look at economic reports, but because I'm because I'm, I'm more of a position trader, I used to look at things like for one year chart. For example, if you go to crude oil and go to one year range, you can see that it's on an uptrend. And that's the same I do for currencies. It's the same I do for, for the stocks I'm holding position. It's, it's on an uptrend. Although, of course, I'm concerned about, but I'm not much concerned about, for example, the EIA inventories, the EIA numbers. I just keep track of the economic data to see if I can, you know, make some decisions, what I'm holding, because for example, if I'm holding a uh, Brazilian stock that relies heavily on commodities, for example, oil or iron ore, like Vale is, is a producer, mm -hmm. I have to look at the iron ore futures and crude oil futures, futures, sorry. But I'm not that much concerned about inventories or you know just look at the economic data factor in and then make decisions sure so that i'm out of a position trader so those those fluctuations you know it's just a signal versus noise for me i just have to identify the signal and because i don't trade the noise sure uh it, it was in the uh, in the daily news today the polyphony versus cacophony you know signal versus noise 
people can trade. Uh, we traders, we have an advantage built in because we can profit from noise and we can profit from signal. But because I'm more of a position trader, I, 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 uh, I usually uh, trade the, uh, the signal, not the noise. Mm. That's yeah. my take. Well, and, and even here on that chart, signal happened here for confirmation. Uh, position trader could have taken it a day late on a two-day candlestick here. Uh, you could have even had a signal here. I mean, you've had triggers for four days in a row here. The reward the to risk. trader could have waited up to break out of 70 yeah. to, to get into and just fine. So depending on technical systems and triggering confirmation, how you know it's defined in that trading system, we're still either working through confirmation. We've already confirmed. Um, but in general, you got to like the reward to risk. There's no doubt about it. I think energy and crude oil is one of the best in the market. Well, and Tim, you're picking it up at the bottom. And I think that's the best argument for crude right now is that from a pure reward to risk perspective, you have a big reward. You have a very little risk because you're picking it up right there at the pivot point. And I think that will offset any concern you have about the EIA numbers. I certainly understand that the EIA numbers tomorrow can come down and trigger my stop loss. There's, there is no doubt about that, but that can happen every Wednesday. Like when Christian said, pull up the one year, one year uh, daily chart, you've had 52 EIA numbers in that chart. And that chart has still been very consistent. And that chart has still been very bullish. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 I'll just wait though. Just personal preference. I will just wait till the morning. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it, it, and part of that matter. Well, if you're not in the trade. Yeah. yeah. If you're not in the trade, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's the best point is to wait. If you got it in on the trigger three days ago, then you're, you got to run through it, but you're off it. You're giving up a little bit of re, re, what you're doing really is you're giving up a little bit of return for less risk is what you're giving up. For, yeah, for more confirmation. And I always, I generally, in most cases, lean on the, the side of confirmation, cushion, those kind of things in, in my analysis. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. All right, let's move on to gold. Gold had a little relief here today for about five minutes, Matt, and then it does not. It's got a doji and a downtrend. At what point do you consider maybe even setting up a new trade on this to the downside? I think the only time you can actually get into is a breakdown out of maybe a close under 1220 with a target of 1200. I don't love the reward versus risk there, Tim. You're probably talking somewhere around one, 1 1.5 to one on the return versus the risk. Um, because in a trigger under 1220, you're talking about at least one half ATR underneath 1220, which means you're probably not even getting in on gold. Let me get uh, the actual number here. You're probably not getting in on gold until perhaps even as it gets down into that 210 level, which is the intraday uh, support level from four days ago. Mm -hmm. I don't see a directional trade on gold right now. It's too close to that 1200 level, which is which is such a vital support level. Well, and with the relationship with the dollar and dollars also stuck in the middle and we don't have exactly clear direction in the short term on that, it's probably a pass until you get a be better candlestick. Christian, are you you an owner of gold and silver metals market in general as an investor? Yeah, gold, gold, because I'm hedging. Like I said on the last show, I I use gold to hedge my portfolio because to hedge my portfolio in Brazil, not in the United States. Although I use gold in the United States to hedge Brazil, is a little bit confusing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I hold so gold. Let me get this right. You you buy gold to hedge both the U.S. and Brazil and pretty much every fiat currency that currently exists in the world. Yeah, that's all the fugazi. You know what a fugazi is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I it's like all it. the fugazi. Like it's fairy dust. Yeah, I hold gold. It's it's an ugly chart, okay. But if you're not long gold because you want to get rich, it's okay. If you go to a five-year chart, for example, there's a there's a huge support zone at twelve hundred ish. And if it breaks down, that's okay. If you're holding gold just to hedge, you know, it's okay. For me, it's even an opportunity to buy more gold, to increase my position in gold. So, yeah, on if, like 1,200-ish. If I would agree with that. Back, I would agree with that if it's not money you need, right? Obviously, you don't buy metals to cash them out. So it wouldn't be a position that you're adding as a way to build profit. It would be a position you're adding to hedge and keep the wealth or the other assets well, that you built. Perfect. Hold on. Yeah. And let, let's also differentiate between owning paper gold and owning real gold. 
if you own real gold, yeah, you're not happy that gold's going down, but you also see it as an opportunity to accumulate more physical gold, right? But if, you, if you're owning the paper, you're not seeing that as a opportunity to, to own more gold because you're taking a loss. There is a difference in the paper versus the real commodity. I mean, the entire purpose of the personal gold system that, that we're developing in tackle trading that should be released sometime in September or October of this year is to cash flow on financial paper assets instruments to compound some of those gains into the physical precious metal so that you don't have to worry about the gold going up or down because you're compounding gains you're taking out of the paper and you're putting it into the actual physical gold. So I do believe there is a sub substantial difference in analyzing gold when you're looking at the hard commodity versus the actual paper asset. If you own the paper asset and that broke 1300 and you weren't out, you made a mistake. If you own the paper asset and that retraced back into 1260, uh, go back to the daily chart there, Tim, and it, it retraced back to 1260 a couple of weeks ago and you didn't get out, you made a mistake. If now gold's at 1220 and you're hoping for a paper asset you know rebounding gold you're making a mistake that there's a difference in analyzing the paper investment versus the actual real commodity investment correct there's no there's no debate about that i think it's really well said you know you had exit points on the chart as a trader over and over and over again matt and let's say you did miss the breakdown you know let's say that this first circle the pink circle you missed it if you don't exit on that 1260, you, you're just not paying attention. You're not focused you, you on what is happening. Yeah. yeah. You're yeah, not I, running your business is what you're not doing. I agree. I mean, the market's been pressured and bearish, and we've been talking about it in the podcast on Skylines for a very, very long time. Gold continues to be a bear call for me until otherwise noted. Uh, other commodities, I mean, you've got some strength across commodities here today. You know, copper, big candle, crude oil, big candle, natural gas is one you trade quite a bit. Long term, it's kind of just stuck in the middle of its range. Do you have a read on this one, Matt? We don't talk about it all the time. Uh, slowing momentum on the downside. This would be an opportunity to sell bull put, uh, excuse me, uh, bull put credit spreads or a naked put on, on natural gas in a cash flow system. But, you know, I'll tell you, knowing natural gas the way I do, it is such a difficult directional instrument, Tim. It, yeah. it is so difficult. Crude, crude is night and day easier to trade than natural gas from a directional component perspective. It is very prone and sensitive to news. It can be wickedly moved one way or the other based on seasonality and weather and, and, and you name it. it crude doesn't have the vol It's amazing, but crude doesn't have that volatility that natural gas has. I love natural gas from a naked put or a credit spread perspective. It is part of the personal gold system. And, you know, when you're looking at na uh, natural gas right now, Tim, and you're saying, and you're saying to yourself, well, it's going down. It's around 272 right now. You know, it, it's been, it's went from three to 272 over the last month. It's starting to fade down a little bit. I expect a little bit of a bump back up to about the 290 level, Tim, on natural mm. gas. And, and I would not go directional on that because uh, of the just the sensitivity natural gas has. But if you understand how to do cash flow systems, what you can do is you can go sell a 2.5 uh, 2 put option on crude. And even one contract on that, you know, you're getting paid six thousand dollars just on one contract on 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 on, you know, oh, excuse me. I want to say it was six six hundred dollars. I had that at 10 contracts. So just give me one second change that to one contract so crude you're getting paid about 60 bucks versus 500 dollars in buying power that's about 11 12 percent projected roi on that tim you know over the next you know 35 days that's a very good naked put you know regarding and you got a lot of range down there you're selling underneath the low points i think that's the you know in my estimation the way to play natural gas is through the credit market it has one of the most liquid commodity product, you know, markets that you can trade. Options on futures are great. The options on the ETF are great. It is a good commodity to trade if you have option systems that are deep out of the money, like you talked about, Matt. Yeah, I like it. Christian, you trade that gas as well? No, no. This is one of yours? No, yeah. not at all. Say la vie. All right, let's move on to the sectors. Now, what I want to do here, Matt, there's a few sectors that are really standing out to me. 
And when the market has got mixed signals, one thing that you can always do is go down and pick one of the individual sectors and run with that, you know, if you believe on it. Uh, there are many here, and I want to go through the charts pretty quick based on strength. I've organized the sectors based on performance strength. Energy today has the best candle, middle of a long-term neutral range. Materials, good candle. Well, hold on, hold on. As, you're, as you're going through these, Tim, just have uh, all of us buy, sell, hold. hold let's do it. We're doing nothing. Buy, we'd buy it, sell, we'd sell it. So let's so do that on, in the chat on, as well with buy, everybody. Sell. Yep. So, so in the chat, guys, Tim's going to go through the sectors, just buy, sell, sell or hold. So buy means you would, you're looking at being a buyer. Sell, you're looking at being a net seller. Hold means you don't like it. You're doing nothing. Okay. So buy, sell, or hold. Energy, Christian. I'm a buy. I'm okay. a hold. I'm a hold. Yeah. I understand the buy, though. If you I don't mind it. Crude, you like it. Okay. Materials. I'll go first this time. I'm a hold. Mm, hold. Hold. Okay, everybody in the chat. And by the way, as you guys are uh, buy, hold, and selling in the chat, make sure you give us a nice little like on YouTube. Really appreciate that, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so let's go down to healthcare. Tim, you're first. Buy, sell, or hold on healthcare. I like to break out. I'm a buy. I'm a buyer on healthcare. Yeah. Showing relative strength, getting up above intraday resistance levels. That's an ES. That's an ES chart right there. If you're buying the ES, you're buying healthcare right now. A lot of the reason that's breaking out as well is that Biogen is in the healthcare sector. A big, you know, hundred billion dollar company had really good earnings today. Uh, tackle twenty five stock. On the tackle twenty five. Mm -hmm. Industrial. Mm. No, I'm a hold. Yeah, hold. I'm a seller on this. I, it, it, as if you're a bull on, on industrials, you hate this chart right here. Number one, in May and June, you had a double top M formation, broke down out of that M formation, uh, come back down into the lows of 71, retrace back into the breakout level at, at 74.50. It retraces back and holds. I like that technical setup to the bear side. I'm a, I'm a seller on uh, industrial. Yeah, old support, new resistance. I mean, that's where I was at as well, but uh, it is in the middle long-term range. It is an ugly chart if it confirms down on a red candle, Matt. You know, there's no doubt about anything, that. Anything on the industrial index, Tim, just to kind of put a number to it. And I want, I'm, look, I'm interested in looking into the chat here, but anything underneath 74, any close under 74, you could see some quick action down, uh, back down to 71. And that's going to drive deer, caterpillar, you know, all those different companies that we've talked Hard about. Game. Yeah, for sure. Uh, tech. Hmm. I'm a buyer. Yeah, I'm a buyer. Yeah, you got to buy it. Red candle is not great. Uh, look, we talked about this 30 minutes ago. It is selling off inter uh, intraday wise, crude strength in intraday wise. But you're still above the breakout level of 73 on the tech sector. Tech has been historically strong. I, I think if there's one sector that you can tell me 20 years from now is, is, is you know, much higher than it is today, it's technology. You don't stop that freight train. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fin financials. Mm, oh, that's not a beautiful chart, but I would wait because there is there is a reason. I'm, I'm on hold. Hold. Although I'm a little bit bullish short term, but there mm -hmm. is a resistance there I, that's pretty ugly. Yeah, and it's that it's that key resistance right there at twenty eight, mm -hmm. at tw about twenty eight twenty five level that gives me a little bit of concern. Uh, showing some strength today. Financials has had really good earnings over the course of the last week. Almost every financial company has done good, um, but I I see that resistance level like Christian does. You want to be a buyer because of the strength coming out of earnings, but a lot of those stocks, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, they were in bearish downtrends coming into resistance levels. The sector's coming into resistance. I'm going to go against the grain. I'm going to say sell here. I, I can't argue with the sell, but I think that's just because you hate the Wall Street banks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. I am not shy about my bias. You know. 
<laughs> That's I, one. I, I think everybody should hit Wall Street banks. I, I, I don't disagree with that part of it. Uh, consumer staples. I'll go first on this one. Consumer staples is not one I picked as a strong buy, but I am getting a very curious above 53. A breakout above 53 on consumer staples, I would be a net buyer above 53. Okay. I agree Chris. with Matt. Yeah, the same. There is a resistance there. It's hitting the resistance, and I would wait for, for a confirmation above 50. Yeah, I love high base breakouts. So That's when we say sell, breakout. are we saying sell short? Well, oh. either sell short, lock in profit. I would, I would not want to be it's long consumer staples into a market where 90% of the companies are beating earnings. I'm a seller here. There are other things for me to put my money into. Uh -huh. Okay. Pretty good short-term bullish uptrend, though. It does have some nice strength. I, I can't argue with that. Uh, real estate. I would buy. But I, last week, I'm buying more today. I love that chart. You know, I, I absolutely love that chart. Still love the chart. Red candles are not fun. There's no doubt about it. You're at that support. You still have a beautiful trend line. I still like the trade Those setup. Trades. Though. Those ranges are getting smaller. It's trying to consolidate above that 32 and at 30, we called it last week, 3225 was your support level on, on real estate. You're currently setting at 3232. Wow. Every time it tests underneath that level, it's fine. I had a stop loss on a 3205 last week. I'm not going to adjust that. I'll probably add to the, uh, add to the trade today. Very good. I'll wait for the, I'll wait for intraday strength, obviously, but yeah. Okay. Utilities. Mm. Mm. I'm not enjoying this chart. I hate that, chart. I hate that, chart. <laughs> I hate that candle. I hate that chart. I hate everything about this chart. Well, look at this candle, um, man. It's not beautiful. Oh, this is the old on. symmetrical triangle here. Oh, is there an option called run away from the chart? Uh, well, Sell, buy, hold, or run away? Yeah, Christian, watch. I can just click right here. Where it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it's gone. I agree. Utilities ugly. Uh, consumer discretionaries. Matt, this one's a tougher one, I think. Let's go with you first. It, it's showing some strength, no doubt about that. It's trying to get up above its breakout level. So, you know, I'm looking at consumer discretionary. Let me look at it on my chart so I can see it a little, a little better here. In looking at consumer discretionary, a lot, and these are a lot of your retail companies, show tremendous strength coming into May and June, a standard retracement later part of June. And now it's just trying to break out of that resistance level. The resistance level is, is 112.50. It is currently at 111.75. So I can understand being a net buyer, there, there is strength in this trend. They're showing some weakness at resistance, but I am still a buyer here of discretionary stocks. Mm, yeah little weakness today and that candle scares me that is a bearish engulfing candle at a key level of resistance that usually means it's going to come back down into a support level forming a cup and a cup and handle pattern i think trading the cup and handle pattern is a little better than buying this breakout right now sure christian you a buyer on this one you're a holder i'm a holder too yeah yeah, yeah. waiting for waiting for a better setup yeah although it's a beautiful chart but it's a really nice chart Couple of stocks on the tackle 25 in the news here today, Matt. Tesla continues to get crushed. Uh, this stock, we've talked about it almost every day because it is one of those stocks that is on, in the news every day. It has got crazy volatility. I mean, is this thing going to really see some pressure? I know we talked about 450 or 150 yesterday. Do you see that happening? Well, uh, negative news came out again today uh, regarding the cost to insure Tesla debt against possible default. Right now, the credit default swap contract is at $5.96 per $100 on the automaker's debt. That is the second highest it's ever been on Tesla. That is a big, big red flag from a fundamental perspective. Tesla is a debt-driven company. News came out the other day that they were Michael Scotting this and asking for uh, money back from their from their suppliers. Now you're getting negative news regarding a credit default here. I, I I mean it's just it's negative news, negative news. I mean obviously this is a fanboy driven stock. It's going to have its lovers. You know Elon's going to have his fan base regardless of what happens. Uh, counting me as one of those fans. 
but this is very concerning in my estimation for for uh, Tesla Tesla long term owners. Yeah, earnings out here on August first as well. I mean, there's nothing but pressure on that stock right now. Red candle, red candle, red candle. Big red candles usually you are. Stock. You better own insurance on that company. You better hedge it, you know. And like you said the other day, maybe you'd rather have a punch in the face. I'm not sure. Uh, Tesla definitely down. Biogen, which we prepped yesterday, had a beautiful gap out. It's backfilling here today. Earnings were strong. Stock that we talked about earlier, Google, Matt, that's why that NASDAQ is backfilling on the candlestick as well. You have these breakout gaps that are now backfilling intraday, these dark cloud covers up here at the top. That's not confirming anything on that move, but a lot of times those stocks will come back and settle into the old resistance, you know? Uh, and we saw that on Nike, right? Yeah. We saw that We saw that on Nike, the first report, uh, earnings report we had. So in terms of this, you know, you're seeing a little bit of profit taking on Biogen and Google. That's driving the intraday price action back down into its gap out ranges on the S&P and the NASDAQ. You know, it's, it's, it's something that is slightly concerning. You wanna see follow through with those types of things. If I'm looking at potentially buying after the earnings, you know, given what's happening intraday, you got to take a wait and see approach here. Um, you know, but, uh, both Biogen and Google both look like it wants to fill the gap. Let it fill if it wants it. When I learned how to actually trade gaps, I mean, it added another arsenal to my trading map that I didn't have before that. I remember in my first probably full year of trading, I just avoided them. You know, I'd see yeah. a gap and it would cause me anxiety. And I'm like, I don't know how to read that. It's not on my trend line. It's not on my moving average. And so I'd kind of avoid them. But gap behavior is something that is definitely, you know, you can develop an edge just trading gaps. Uh, in fact, a lot of times, you know, if I'm looking for a trade on a daily basis, I might look at the companies who are either reporting earnings in the next few days or who have reported earnings and find some of those gap patterns that might find themselves interesting. Christian, do you trade gaps? No. Kind of leave them alone? Yeah. Cause you anxiety. They're, they're actually yeah. really difficult to trade. <laughs> yeah, they are of. really difficult to trade. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Tim, on, on Google, for example, make the argument, is that an exhaustion gap? Is that a runaway gap? Is that a breakaway gap? Because how you're assessing that gap range will change how you're going to approach that. If that's an exhaustion gap, you're talking about Google actually showing a little bit of short-term bearish downtrend. If that's a runaway gap, you should buy that right now. I, I mean, it, 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 I, it's very hard to assess that from a technical probability perspective until you see the follow through. And, and you know, what I'd like to do on, on these types of gaps is I'd like to give it a day, you know, just oh, give yeah. it a day, see if these, see if they follow through. I don't think you play it today. There, there's no question. It's kind of like that Netflix one we were looking at a week ago, Matt, you know, it gapped down back filled. The entry was the, the next couple of days, right? It was as yeah, it settled it in. Get, that's right. So Google, it gaps out. Maybe it backfills. Right now, I, if you made me label the gap, uh, I'd say that is an exhaustion gap going to backfill into the old resistance. Right. I think you have to call it a, 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 at this point, based on what you're seeing in the price action, I think you have to call that an, exha an exhaustion gap. Yeah. You're talking about a, tr a stock that was trending before the gap. It gapped outside of its range. It sold off intraday pretty hard, you know, which, which leads you to the expectation that that selling is going to come back down in price, back down to the, uh, the, the gap out range. And that gap out range is right around you know, 1210 to 1220. I think you might have a really good bullish uh, opportunity in the next few days, but only when it comes back down. Yeah. And by the way, this is also a good reminder as to why when you're playing those earnings plays, you have to have a plan. You know, if you had done, for example, that inverted fly on Google throughout the day, it has gone from profit to loss just on the gap, right? You know, uh, when we started this halftime report earlier, that was on a small profit, just like three or 400 bucks. Now I've got a $300 loss because that behavior of where it is and how it deals with it, you've got to have an exact plan on that, right? You know, there's no doubt. I oh, love yeah. earnings, but you're dealing with um, if, more emotion. If you're not around, if you're not around, you shouldn't be trading earnings because earnings are all about the management that day after the earnings. 
if you were trading that short strangle on that gap range, I guarantee you freaked out and probably, you know, got out of the trade on the earnings. It was, it, it was running at the very first of the day. You probably freaked out. You probably would an hour later probably would have said, you know what? I wish I would have stayed in the trade. No, you, no, you don't. It was running really, really hard. You were going to take loss after loss sure. on the inverted fly. You probably would have started locking in profit right then. Well, and, and he, even like right here, you know, Biogen had a big profit on it before, you know, we were, we opened that trade up at a 270 credit. Do you ever want to kind of see where they are right now? It's at a 270 credit this morning when it opened up, Matt, you could have bought that back for a buck 50, you know? So you had yeah. profit windows on these volatility trades. A lot of earnings is understanding management the day of the day after all of those kind of things. And I do recommend any trader learn how to do it because if you can learn how to do it, you'll understand the conversations better about why it's a gap fill or an exhaustion gap or whatnot, because you're in the thick of it, living it day by day by day as you're watching these gaps happen, right? Don't avoid them. Yeah. I mean, that's my advice. Don't avoid them. Try to embrace them. Try to understand them because there's a lot of strategies that you can play themselves out with. Uh, let's take a peek at very quickly, though, I just think the secondary move on the gap after earnings is the better trading opportunity than the initial reaction to the earnings. Sure. I mean, that's what we did with Netflix last week, you know, and now here's Netflix down at 355, still kind of playing itself out same way the whole market is, right? It was that post gap play that was the better confirmed trade on this candlestick here as those red candles were developing. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. A yeah. couple of minutes here. Let's kind of highlight a few stocks that are going to have earnings today, Matt. Today after the market, at and you know, probably the big Moving game, on. right? Yeah, nothing really. Kind of a boring stock. Yeah. Tomorrow before the market, Boeing, Coca-Cola, UPS, uh, no, Nextra, Thermo Fisher, you know, GD, GM, you got a couple of big names in here, Matt. Tomorrow's going to also be another one. Which one do you think is the most important? The only one that can move that in the market is Boeing. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of important ones there that, you know, that are important, like Coca-Cola is important. You know, General Motors is important. But Boeing has been a leader in the industry, se in the industrial sector. It is, it is, it's had an absolutely fantastic last few years, showing a little bit of weakness this year so far. Um, I, I think that's just more broad market concern than anything else. Um, but I'm looking, Boeing's being on the Tackle 25, a stock that I really, really like. Um, I'm looking forward to their earnings coming uh, tomorrow morning. 725B, I always look at the whisper on the companies that are on my watch list and Boeing, it, you know, I don't know why it's not like I do anything with it, but I like to know. Uh, the estimate is 359. You know, the consensus is 345. They're expecting to have 23 billion in revenue. Compare that to Google the other day. Google was expected nine or something like that. It's a huge, important company, obviously. Massive, well, company. massive, massive company. They are pretty consistent about hitting expectations. They're not usually a crazy gap out 50 points kind out. of stock. So, you know, and, and shockingly, you're talking about, and, and I know this goes against what I said the other day, but this is, to me, you know, Boeing is more of a short strangle on earnings than it is, or an iron condor on earnings than it is an inverted fly. I agree with that. I agree with that. All right, let's uh, back this down to where we can see everybody. And guys, that has been our show for today. Uh, if you enjoy these and you're getting value out of them, go down and click that thumbs up button and put something in the chat. What's your favorite part of the show? Is it going through the market, going through the routine? And Matt, we were gonna do a little Christian, Q and A here. Hair. It's Christian's glow. It's my it's orange Christian's hair. He's got a he's he's got a glow to him today. There's there's no doubt about that. My orange face. Uh, Dan, Daniel on. has a question. Would I put a trade on? So put on trade tonight for B A. You have to price the volatility well, like we did yesterday. Part. Yeah, it would have to be before four yeah, o'clock east. It. Yeah, because they report before the market opens tomorrow, Dan. More hang time with the coaches, James. Good to have you. Thank you, Jacques, for being here. See you, James. Yeah. 
In the future, guys, what I'd like to do at the end of these shows is go over any Q&A that you have. So if anybody has a question right now for Christian, Matt, myself, we could even throw Cam in here. I'd ask Cam to share his uh, video, but he might be shirtless again. <laughs> hey, hey, Tim, from now on at 1120, regardless of what we're talking about, just make an announcement for Q&A so yep. that people can prime their question. Yep. So uh, everybody you guys the enjoying the show. You guys having fun? You're enjoying the halftime report? Helping you do your daily routine? By the way, Matt, uh, you know, awesome. I've got two computers I'm running right now. That is changing today. I've got my new computer. It just showed up at the house. I'm in, installing it in my office here after uh, our meetings today. Well, I'm going golfing. Where are you playing golf? Carbon Country Club. So when you go into a round like this, you're not, you're not played a lot, but you played there this year, but you played a little bit lately. What's your goal? Well, it's kind of like Tiger when he goes and he, he's, uh, you know, uh, looking at Karnuski a, a week before the tournament. You and I are coming down to uh, golf in our sister's Parrot Head tournament here at Carbon Country Club here in a, a couple weeks from now. And we're going over there to, uh, to, to get a lay of the land, see where I want to hit my uh, drives offline. <laughs> so you just want to enjoy it, have a few good holes, hopefully yeah, not I mean, score crazy. <laughs> no, nah, me and my brother-in-law, he's going to, we're going to go over there today and, you know, go have a little bit of a friendly wager. I'm sure I'll have a few, uh, a few beers. He'll drive me home. It's, it's going to be fantastic. Nothing wrong with that. Christian, you play golf? No, I play nothing, sir. I understand golf as much as I understand quantum physics. Uh, <laughs> well, I feel like that sometimes I too. I think every I golfer guitar, feels that way. Though I play the guitar, this is one thing I play. I could see that. I could see the guitar. <laughs> Doesn't he also look like he has a tennis face? But he has a what? A tennis face. Tennis. A tennis face. I think he could play tennis. Yeah. He reminds me of um, what's that really good? Um, I think he's. What is his name? I don't want like 20 majors. <laughs> Nadal. He's, he's Swiss. Nadal? No, Nadal. Federer. No, no. Isn't Nadal Federer? Federer. That's who it is. Doesn't he kind of look like Federer? A little young Federer? You know, Gosh. You know Federer just signed like an $80 million sponsorship with some watch company. And it's good to be a pro athlete in 2018. That's promising. Christian is my Brazilian version of uh, Kurt Cobain, reincarnated. So I like it. I less like tennis, it. more like rock it. and roll, in my okay. opinion. Okay, now I Mind you, though. <laughs> mind you, hey, Christian. What? Christian, when we had you on the halftime report, the market sold off intraday pretty hard. Yeah, of course. Just, yeah. Of course. We can't Your break the habit. continues, brother. Yeah. yeah the streak yeah, continues. So every well, time we, we have yeah. Christian on, short the market. What if we add Coach Mark? I mean, it's going to be the four horsemen. That's, that's, well, it's going to explode. that's too much testosterone in the same room. <laughs> I you, and, you and Mark, would, your heads would, would combust. They, they, I, don't think, I don't think the world could take you and Mark live together. I did have one question come in here in the chat, Matt. Uh, what price and date would you do on BA for Jasmine? From Jasmine. Jasmine? Um, looking at this, you know, again, we were talking about this the other day, you got to kind of back, you got to kind of, you know, prep a couple different dates to look at the range on it. The market maker move on Boeing is 12 points. The average gap range when you're looking at, you know, opens to closes and whatnot will come in right in line with about that $12 range. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to look at a short strangle with, 24 days. And I like doing these, these earnings plays on monthly contracts, not on weekly contracts. Your management is so much more important when you're dealing with liquidity in, in the options market. So if you're looking at selling in the 20 with 24 days left and you got to sell 24 points out of the money one way or the other, you're talking right about what would that be? 332. So you're talking about an 18 Delta. You could do that with the 24 day contract on the top side. You're looking at three, 380. 380 would be the 17 delta. So you could you could go probably down to the 385 on the call side and the 325 on the put side, 
looking at a 12 at, uh, 12 deltas. So I, I could definitely see a 325 by 385 short strangle. If you're looking at selling that on the on the strangle, let me just kind of price it in here. You're looking mm -hmm. at receiving, oh, I was gonna say, wow, that's a big credit, but I didn't change my call site on my equation. So I got to change that to 385 on the call. Jasmine, this is a wonderful question, by the way. 385, where you get about, you know, 324 on the credit, margin requirement of about 4,000, you know, about 4,000 on that. You're talking somewhere around 8% return on investment. I don't know. And looking out to that 59-day 59, 59 contract, I kind of like that one a little bit more. You're getting a lot more range on that, Jasmine, on the 59-day 59, 59 yeah. contract. And like I said yesterday, I, in these types of earnings plays, you know, my rule is two times the market maker move on short strangles, and then you want to be even a little bit more conservative than that. So you could do that with the 24-day contract, but I just think that 59-day 59, 59-day contract is going to give you a little bit more range, and you're still going to be able to take advantage of the volatility crush with 59-day contract the same way you would be with the 24-day. Well, think about it like this, Matt. That's really, really good analysis, and I think it's a really good tip right there. The 24-day contract is going to capture it quicker if you can get it to work. But the 59 day contract is still within the three month volatility cycle. So <clears throat> market makers are going to crush that volatility more than say a 120 day contract. I like that 59 day one here. If I was going to play it, I'm going to pass on a, on a neutral trade on that. I just, I just, I, you know, and I'm, I'm going to have to look at it before the close today, but honestly, I think the word of the day when you're dealing with earnings is be conservative just always be more conservative with your range when you're dealing with earnings. 100%. They're, they're, they're the biggest risk versus return in the marketplace. And those sort of strangles can get absolutely destroyed on, on big, big, big movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd more, be more willing to look at something else. Probably going to play that post earnings though. Ameritrade on the gap yeah. from Tiago had one last question here. It looks like that Google candlestick, Tiago, gap out backfill red candle. That is uh, ooh, ugly, pretty much. But it, again, it's one of those what's exhaustion the, gaps. The AMTD. Here, let me show you. Oh, Meritrade. Yeah, same, same type of thing. But unlike Google, you're hitting in a tremendous amount of resistance levels on, on TD Ameritrade versus some of the other ones. I still, I still have a couple shorts going on in the banking sector, so I hope that whole thing burns down. <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> I gotcha. And by the way, on the Boeing stuff, you know, when what Matt was talking about with the weeklies versus the monthlies, in Thinkorswim, they color code them differently. So yeah. what he means by the monthlies is this one regular one. Weeklies have the word weeklies next to them. On a lot of companies – it, it's fine on some, but you, if you want to lean on the side of caution, the monthly is usually more liquid, Matt, for sure. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's chalk it up to you. Very good. All right. Very good, guys. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Same time, same station. I think Coach Emily is joining me tomorrow. Is that right? Or is it Christian? Christian, you back here tomorrow? I don't, I don't know. We'll figure it out. I know me and Matt will be here. We'll figure it out. Guys, thanks so much for listening to the Tackle Trading Halftime Report. It's it, You guys are the best part of Tackle Trading. Thank you for everything you bring to the table. Thank you for being a part of our team. As you, If you like the coaches, uh, the Tackle Trading Halftime Report, guys, give it a nice little like on YouTube. Join us every single day. Let's make this an absolutely fun-filled uh, hour of the trading day, you know, looking at the intraday markets, looking at trading, just traders talking to trading uh, other traders. That's what this is all about. So, guys, thanks, and we'll see you tomorrow on YouTube. Bye, everyone.